The first battle of Mount Hermon was fought at the outset of the Yom Kippur War between the Syrian army, and the Israel Defense Forces. On Yom Kippur, October 6, 1973, Syrian commandos attacked and captured the IDF outpost on Mount Hermon. Two days later, the Syrians repelled an Israeli counterattack in the Second Battle of Mount Hermon. It was eventually recaptured by Israel on October 21 in the Third Battle. Chapter 1 Background At a height of about 6,600 feet, Mount Hermon has a commanding view of the Galilee. After Israel's capture of it in the Six-Day War, it was used as a radar outpost, housing some of the IDF's most sensitive and secret electronic equipment. Israel also constructed an approach road and a ski lift. The troops manning the Hermon outpost could view the entire Syrian plain bordering on the Purple Line, there were observation posts on the outpost itself and at the upper level of the ski lift. The outpost was constructed with much help from the Druze living in the Golan. In April 1970, Colonel Haikmat Shahabi, chief of Syrian military intelligence, sent a letter with Sergeant Major Nozi Tufik Abu Saleh, a Syrian Druze, to Kamal Kanj, a Golan Heights Druze leader and former member of the Syrian parliament whose brother was a general in the Syrian army. Saleh, who was also related to Kanj, crossed the border on foot and delivered the letter, which asked Kanj to provide details regarding Israeli positions. Kanj agreed and carried out his mission. He was caught by the Israeli Military Intelligence Directorate in May 1971. He was pardoned in June 1973. The Herman outpost was considered strategically important for several reasons, such as gathering early warning information, real time intelligence collection, conducting electronic warfare against ground or air attack artillery spotting on the Damascus Plain, using the Hermon Ridge and its western slopes for a strategic flanking move towards Syria, conducting operations in Syria, and Lebanon and commanding Israel's main water sources. The outpost was isolated in its sector with only a narrow access road connecting it to the Golan Heights and Shebar farms. It was made up of three levels, an underground section of bunkers for quarters, ammunition, food and water, and two above-ground stories which contained the work rooms, laboratories, infirmary, mess, generators and observation and guard posts. When the war broke out, the outpost was still under construction and fighting positions, communication trenches and the command position were not yet built. The outpost was situated in the 13th Battalion's sector, but was commanded by Lieutenant Gardi Zidova from the 820th Regional Brigade, whose operational subordination was not properly classified. On Yom Kippur there were 60 soldiers in the outpost, 13 of them were 13th Battalion infantrymen, the rest were men from support units, artillerymen, non-commissioned officers from the Israeli Northern Command and Regional Brigade Intelligence and maintenance soldiers, from the 820th Brigade. Some of the officers and soldiers had only arrived between October 4 and October 6 with just their personal weapons, others were unarmed. Most of them were not familiar with the layout of the outpost or with the sector in general. In the days before the war, the artillery forward observation officer reported a growth in the number of Syrian artillery batteries and other forces. A section of troops were assigned to defend it. On Yom Kippur, October 6, 1973, 55 men were in the outpost, including the defense section from the Galani Brigade, men from the Israeli Air Force and intelligence personnel manning the electronic equipment. North Carolina estimated that the Herman was not a major axis of advance, and would therefore not be subject to a major attack, only routine raids. The fortifications were built to withstand artillery fire and air bombardments, but the trench system was incomplete. A week before the war, an anti-aircraft battery was moved down to the Golan. Chapter 2 Prelude On Friday, October 5, the outpost reported a vast concentration of Syrian forces on the plain below. The Israeli soldiers were ordered to be on the alert, they shut themselves in the main bunker. The next morning, the observation posts were manned as usual and routine reconnaissance along the approach routes took place. An alert was ordered, but for some reason the Herman outpost was not reinforced by the required 14-man infantry section. 
The security routine was maintained and included a foot patrol to secure the access road from the outpost to the lower level of the ski lift. It was conducted by the Galani troops and commanded by the platoon commander, 2nd Lieutenant Haggai Funk. Only two infantrymen were left to guard the outpost. After the patrol, the infantrymen returned to the outpost, except for three men who took up positions in an under-construction observation post on a hill north of the upper ski lift. One observation point and two guard positions were manned in the outpost itself. Three watches were deployed at dawn between Shibar Farms and the lower ski lift, manned by members of the same company, but were subordinated throughout the day to the 902nd Nahal Battalion in Shibar Farms. Shortly before 1400 hours, an EU blocking company from the 374th Communications Unit, under the command of Lieutenant Moshe Sapir, arrived at the tank curve and located its equipment according to North Carolina orders. Due to coordination problems, its arrival was unknown to the outpost commander and the Herman Company commander at the employment camp in Masada. The Syrians had put the Herman at the top of their target list. The 82nd Paratroop Battalion, the elite combat unit of the Syrian army, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Ahmed Rifai Al Joju, was given its final briefing on the morning of the attack. Al Joju's company was to be landed by helicopter 0.5 miles from the outpost and take up positions covering the outpost and the road leading toward it from the Golan. The rest of the battalion, about 200 men, were to set out on foot from the Syrian controlled Herman. This force was to attack the outpost while Al Joju's troops would provide them with covering fire. The plan used data collected through Kanj. Chapter 3 Battle Chapter 3 Section 1, Syrian Attack At around 1300 hours, four Soviet-built Mi-8 helicopters lifted off near Damascus and flew west into Lebanon, where they circled until 45 minutes into the Syrian shelling of the Golan. They then headed southeast toward the Israeli outpost. The Israelis detected the helicopters at about 1500 hours, when the team at the upper ski lift reported them and fired at them until they flew out of sight. At 1345, the artillery officer, along with other officers, noticed that the Syrian artillery units in the plain below were taking the camouflage nets from their guns. The Syrians began shelling the outpost at 1400 hours. All the Israeli soldiers in the outpost concentrated in the central hall of the bunker. The platoon officer and the mortar sergeant climbed up to the observation point but had to come back down due to the heavy shelling. An observation officer, a technical assistant and a driver from the 334th Artillery Battalion left the outpost in a half-track for their planned position in the tank curve to help pinpoint the artillery in the northern Golan. Six Syrian Air Force MiG-17 aircraft attacked the outpost. Three of the helicopters arrived from the west. Two of them landed about 30 paratroopers on Hill 2072, south of the lower ski lift. Most of the Syrian force deployed above the curve south of the upper ski lift to block access to the outpost. A few of them advanced toward the outpost to provide cover. A third helicopter with 16 paratroopers, who were supposed to block the tank curve, crashed. Only three paratroopers survived and joined their comrades at the upper ski lift. They opened fire on the Israeli half-track, which kept driving. The company commander of the EU unit and his driver, who were riding in a jeep on their way to the outpost, saw the Syrians landing and turned back to their unit at the tank curve, under fire. Three Galani soldiers at the upper ski lift observation post saw the Syrian landing but failed to fire at them due to a machine gun malfunction. After a few minutes, they abandoned their post, which was equipped with a radio, and went down to the lower ski lift to join a platoon position there without informing the outpost of the Syrian landing. While Joju's troops were taking up positions, the rest of the 82nd Battalion, two companies under the command of Captains Jassam al Salah and Mahmoud Malay, advanced on foot from the Syrian-controlled Herman position to the Israeli outpost. They were organized in eight platoon-sized forces. At around 1515, when the first two forces arrived near the outpost, 
Syrian artillery opened fire and the covering force directed small arms fire at the outpost. Meanwhile, the fourth helicopter approached, and landed 16 more commandos. Some of them joined the charge at the outpost while the rest formed a second covering force. When the shelling subsided, small arms fire could be heard from the central hall, Zidova, Funk, and four other Gilani soldiers came out to the fighting platform through the upper western opening. They saw dozens of Syrian soldiers advancing on the road toward the outpost gate, and a covering force lying on the embankment outside the outpost fence. Of the three machine guns, two were out of action after the shelling. Lacking fighting positions, the outpost commander and the infantrymen opened fire with a machine gun and their personal weapons. The Syrians were surprised by the fire and halted. The machine gunner was killed and the outpost sergeant took the weapon over. The outpost commander realized that ammunition was low and went down to the central hall to contact the 820th Brigade commander, Colonel Tsevi Barazani. He explained the situation and asked him to fire on our outposts. Barazani approved and the 334th Battalion commander, Lt. Col. I. A. Schwartz, accepted the mission. The Galani soldiers kept firing at the Syrians and prevented them from entering the outpost until approximately 1545, when the Israeli shelling began. At this point Barazani ordered the outpost commander to shut his men in the outpost until the shelling was over and break out only on his command. Due to a misunderstanding, the soldiers did not leave the outpost and continued defending its openings from within. The Syrians charged into the outpost courtyard and some managed to penetrate the upper western opening into the top story, throwing fragmentation and stun grenades and firing into the work rooms. Their entrance was hesitant and slow, and included calls in Hebrew and Arabic to the Israeli soldiers to surrender. Some went down the staircase leading to the central hall and threw grenades into it. They reached the hall but did not enter the rooms or the connecting tunnels. They may have used a smoke generator operated by a small engine. The hall filled with smoke dust and the sounds of explosions, which induced panic among the Israeli non-combatant soldiers. Many of them were choking and believed the Syrians were using gas. The room was full of dust, they had to cover their noses with flannelette soaked in urine to breathe. They tried to take cover in the tunnels, some were in a state of shock and remained frozen in the rooms near the central hall. Between 1600 hours and 1700 hours, some of the soldiers returned fire from various corners of the central hall in the direction of the staircase and prevented the Syrians from coming down. The outpost commander tried to concentrate the men from the different tunnels and rooms into a single tunnel. At this point, the outpost lost its connection with the outside world. At about 1730, the outpost commander and several infantry soldiers tried to break out through one of the tunnels in order to get out and reach the upper ski lift, but they encountered some Syrians and had to return. Most of the men were now concentrated in the same tunnel, except for the doctor and two Galani soldiers one of whom was dead and the other wounded. Five others hid in two bunkers in the bottom level. Since some of the men did not know their way around the outpost, they split up in the dark into two groups, which remained close to each other. At around 1900 hours, the Syrians stopped clearing the interior of the Israeli position and it became relatively quiet. Chapter 3 Section 2 Wadi Sion at around 1650, the men in the Hedva observation post, located near the Lebanese village of Sheba, were ordered to move back to Masada through the lower ski lift with their armored personnel carrier. At about 1700 hours, the APC, along with an 81mm mortar half-track approached Wadi Sion, both positions came under heavy fire from the ridge above them. The APC was hit by an RPG, and stopped in the middle of the road. Three Israeli soldiers were killed instantly, the rest were wounded and took cover. The Talai commander, exposed in his half-track, was hit by a bullet in the back, but the driver started the vehicle and sped off toward the lower ski lift. The attacking Syrians were probably the blocking force from the 87th Reconnaissance Battalion, which was supposed to take up positions in the tank curve that night. 
but strayed into the area above the road from the lower ski lift and Sheba farms. The Syrians maintained a constant fire and left without coming down to the road. At nightfall, at around 1735, after the Syrians left, the Hedva observation post reported the encounter to the 902nd Battalion Company headquarters at Sheba Farms and asked for assistance. Company headquarters reported to the 820th Brigade headquarters at Nafuk. Putting together a rescue force which included a doctor, a paramedic and five infantrymen, took an hour. The force, advancing in two APCs, moved slowly and carefully with its lights off. At about 18.30, it arrived at the location, treated the wounded, and evacuated them. From that moment until the end of the war, no IDF troops entered the territory between Sheba Farms and the Herman Mountainside. At around 1930, Barazani ordered the commander of the Herman Company, Lieutenant Yifta Sagiv, to head from Masada to the lower ski lift with an APC and a tank platoon from the attached 71st Battalion, to check on the outpost and evacuate the wounded that had arrived in the afternoon. The force reached the lower ski lift at around 2100 hours. Sarkifs saw that everything was in order and reported that fact to the battalion commander. Barazani ordered him to leave the tank platoon to defend the place. The company commander left on his own accord to evacuate the wounded to Nafuk. When he arrived near midnight, he reported to the North Carolina chief and the others about the incidents at the Herman Dot at around 2100 hours, the outpost commander decided to try to escape to the lower ski lift. Due to a lack of communication with the other men, only he, five officers and eleven soldiers got out. They crossed a minefield, went down the Bulan Valley and headed west toward the upper ski lift. Just before 2300 hours, as they began to head down a rocky slope from the upper ski lift, the Syrian blocking force saw them and opened fire. The platoon commander and five of his men charged down the hill. Three were killed, including the platoon commander, two were taken prisoner the next day. Other officers and soldiers took cover and returned fire. The observation officer was badly wounded and later died. The other eleven, some of whom were wounded, escaped the encounter and scattered. The escapees ran down the road, and encountered three Israeli tanks heading their way. One of the tanks fired at them before they could identify themselves. During the night, and the next day, ten of them made their way back to the Israeli lines. A soldier from the IF unit in the outpost accidentally entered a 183rd Syrian battalion position, deployed on high point 1614. He was caught and executed the next day. Chapter 3 Section 3 Counterattack At 1807, North Carolina accepted the suggestion raised by the Galani Brigade commander, Colonel Amir Drory, to try to reach the outpost. While the eleven Israeli soldiers were trying to make their escape, a Galani force, made up of Drory's command half-track, the 51st Battalion Command Post with Companies A and B in 15 more half-tracks, the 69th Reconnaissance Company in eight other half-tracks and the Brigade's Battalion Collecting Station in an ambulance, was on its way to the Herman. The force left Rosh Pina at 7.01 and reached Nevative at 4.01, but North Carolina ordered Drory to stop, fearing a Syrian breakthrough in the Hadar Masada sector and ordered him to deploy for a block around bunkers 103, 104 and 105, with the 13th Battalion subordinated to the brigade. Unaware of the situation throughout the Golan, Drory objected, assuming it was best to strike as early as possible and deny the Syrians time to organize. He was denied, and the force started moving back via the Saar Bridge toward Masada. At 4.21, Drory was ordered to organize for a block, and at 5.19 his troops were deployed in their sector. Dot while the reduced 51st Battalion and the 69th Company were deployed around Masada at around 7 o'clock, a convoy came down from the lower ski lift, having been ordered to do so by the 13th Battalion Commander, Lt. Col. Zervorn. It included a tank platoon from the 71st Battalion, the infantry platoon from the 13th Battalion manning the lower ski lift in two BTR-152 APCs, 
the observation officer's half-track and the communications company from the 374th unit in its three vehicles. It also included the five survivors from the outpost. The three tanks remained attached to the Galani Brigade. Thirty-six soldiers were still trapped in the outpost. Two Israeli soldiers wounded in the encounter on the ridge were captured by the Syrians. Six of the soldiers who escaped made their way down the mountain, along with three observation soldiers who escaped from the upper ski lift. Chapter 3 Section 4 Capture At around six o'clock on October 7, the two wounded soldiers that were captured were questioned and taken to a ravine outside the outpost. At around nine o'clock, the Israeli soldiers in the northeastern tunnels heard shots in the courtyard. The Syrians may have fired Israeli weapons captured at the upper ski lift, and some of the Israeli soldiers thought it was their rescuers firing. Four soldiers hiding in the communication bunker heard the shots and came out through a position blown up by the Syrians that morning. Noticing soldiers with olive-colored uniforms, Uzis and an IDF helmet, a radio technician came out and yelled Galani, Galani, don't shoot, before his eyes had adapted to the sunlight when he noticed they were Syrians. He and the others ran back in, and the Syrians chased them, throwing smoke grenades. Not knowing where the other Israelis were hiding, the Syrians called on them to surrender through the generator gratings and pointed flashlights inside, saying that whoever did not come out would be killed. The Israelis contemplated surrender, but the Galani platoon sergeant refused, opting instead to try to break out through the northeastern position. At around 11 o'clock, he led them through the tunnel connecting the generators to the position. He came out onto the roof first, followed by a Galani soldier, and a man soldier and a radio operator. They were spotted on the roof, near the main entrance of the anti-aircraft hill north of the outpost, dot perhaps as a response to the Syrian calls to surrender, the sergeant opened fire and threw two grenades at the Syrians. The three Israelis were killed soon after. The others who got out lay in a trench, the Syrians firing at them but missing. When they concluded they had no chance, they surrendered. The radio technician, who waved a piece of white cloth, was killed. The Syrians held their fire, ordered the Israelis down to the courtyard and told them to lay down their weapons and helmets. At about 11.30, two Syrians entered the doctor's room on the top story and captured him along with two Galani soldiers who were with him, one of them badly wounded. In the late afternoon, the 26 captured Israelis were disarmed and their hands tied with telephone wire, they were then led, tied in pairs, toward the Syrian outpost. They were escorted by about 30 Syrian soldiers, from the 82nd Battalion. A badly wounded Gulani soldier who fell behind was killed, his body left behind. From the Syrian outpost, the prisoners were transferred by trucks to a special forces training base at Kaboon, near Damascus, where they stayed for four days. Five Israeli soldiers were left in the outpost, a quartermaster hiding in the emergency bunker and four soldiers hiding in the war room bunker. They found some rations in the nearby maintenance bunker and a plastic water tank, which sustained them until October 12. Using a transistor radio, they heard that the Israeli settlers in the Golan had returned to their homes and so decided to keep hiding until the IDF recaptured the outpost. In the first three days, the Syrians raked the outpost with gunfire and grenades each morning and each night. When the outpost became relatively quiet, the Israelis tried on more than one occasion to get out, but returned after hearing the Syrian guards in the central hall. At around 11 o'clock on Friday October 12, Syrian soldiers entered the tunnels to look for food and caught the Israelis, including the quartermaster, by accident. The prisoners were transferred through the Syrian outpost to Kaboon. On October 15, all 31 prisoners were taken to an olive grove and photographed by journalists, they were transferred to a prison the next day. Chapter 4, Aftermath In the battles fought in the outpost itself, near the upper ski lift and in Wadi Sion, 16 Israelis were killed and 12 wounded. Seven were killed and four wounded in the outpost, four were killed and three wounded near the upper ski lift, 
three were killed and four wounded in the Cyan encounter. Two were executed by the Syrians after their capture, thirty-one were taken prisoner. Syrian casualties were fifteen killed and three officers wounded trying to penetrate the outpost. The Syrians captured the outpost, the lower ski lift and the entire Hermann mountain side. Soviet advisors arrived at the outpost a few days later to dismantle the electronic equipment, they were pleased to find most of it intact. Syrian interrogators were also able to extract valuable information from the captured Israelis. The electronic equipment was sent to the Soviet Union for analysis, the documents captured compromised Israeli military codes. With the fall of the Herman, a man lost its eyes on the Golan, the loss of the antennas on the listening posts damaged its ability to collect information. Author Abraham Robinovich wrote that the fall of the Herman was for Israel the single most humiliating episode of the Yom Kippur War. Author Walter J. Boyne commented that this was the first time in Israel's history that a commander had abandoned a position while his troops were still fighting. Funk was believed by many Israelis to be at fault for the defeat, as summarized by one soldier, the officers ran away. The Israelis made a failed attempt to recapture the Herman on October 8, but finally succeeded on October 21, in Operation Desert.